what am I gonna do? I'm gonna turn on the All right. Uh, you ready, Joe? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> all right. Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to see you all. Thank you all for coming and giving up your, maybe it's your lunchtime or morning tea time if you're coming from Western Australia, like our special guest presenter. Uh, and I know it's well into the afternoon if you are in New Zealand, well into a Friday afternoon. <laughs> um, so if you're here from New Zealand, you know, extra kudos to you. Um, uh, there we go. Yeah. So people from Perth as well. Uh, my name's Keith Heggett, and I am one of the co-conveners uh, co of the Ascolite Learning Design SIG, uh, and I'm joined today by Dr. Kashmira Dave, um, who's one of the other co-conveners, and Leanne No is, is not feeling 100%, so she's not going to join us today. So it's just me and Kashmira driving today. Um, and we want to say welcome. Whether you're a member of Ascolite or not, we have these monthly webinars because we want to talk about learning design and everything related to learning design, um, and we hope you find some value in them. They are recorded and we upload them to the Ascolite Learning Design channel, um, so just keep that in mind um, as, as, as we, we go through. Uh, but these, these are intended to be um, interactive and, and, you know, discussions. Uh, so there'll be plenty of times in this presentation where we want to hear from you, your thoughts, your ideas, your comments, your suggestions. Um, but we will do the formalities first. So a couple of things I just want to mention. Don't forget the Ask Light 2023 conference is coming up. It's in Christchurch, New Zealand. It's going to be fantastic. It is also a hybrid event. So if you can't make it to New Zealand, you will be able to join online. And the theme is people, partnerships and pedagogies. Um, as I mentioned, you can also join our LinkedIn group. We're going to be using the LinkedIn group more and more for communications and events and registrations uh, as we work out how best to do that. Um, so that's a good place to find out everything that's happening in learning design uh, in Australasia. Uh, and I think we're up over 500 members on that LinkedIn group, which I think is fantastic. Um, yeah. Um, I'll talk a bit more about some other events, but before I do that, I would like to make sure... Uh, that I do acknowledge the traditional owners of, of the, the land upon which we are meeting, wherever that might be. I'm coming to you from Darug land in Western Sydney uh, on the banks of the Darabin River. Uh, and if you want to tell us where you're coming from, and I know some of you already have, um, we'd, we'd love to hear it in the chat. Um, I just want to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people who are present today or who are listening to this recording. A um, couple of things we've got coming up. All right. So I've talked about the LinkedIn group. Um, yeah. Uh, so there's another link. Uh, and I'll just put the chat, the, the URL in the chat again. Uh, there you go. But this is what I really want to talk about. I want to talk about some of the upcoming events that are for um, this learning design special interest group. So this is something that we're doing new. Uh, it, we will continue with the monthly webinars because we know people get a lot out of them. But the other thing that we're doing is we are having some hackathons. Um, we're calling it LD Hack. It's all about building capacity through design thinking. Uh, and you can come along to one, two, three, or all of them if you want. You've only missed the induction session thus far, um, but our first one kicks off in just a couple of weeks on Friday. Um, and that's going to be a really great online event. Uh, and then there's two more online ones. And then you can see that there will be two hybrid or face-to-face -face events as well, um, which are going to be all-day events. So if you want to get in the room, the virtual room or the real physical room with some learning designers and share ideas and talk about how you'd approach and solve problems, come along to the hackathons because they are absolutely um, what they are there for. All right. Um, now <laughs> let's get to the important point, the reason why we're all here. Um, I want to introduce you to our special guest who will be leading our webinar today, uh, and her name is Jo Lyons. So Jo is currently a senior learning designer who works in the Centre for Learning and Teaching at Edith Cowan University in Western Australia. She's been a learning designer for more than 10 years and has uh, specialities in things like technology-enhanced learning, uh, complex curriculum design, career readiness and work-integrated learning, as well as assessment best practice. Um, jo is committed to supporting high quality teaching and learning and engages in evaluation of learning and collaborative um, 
uh, studies of teaching and learning research as part of her ongoing practice. Um, she's an online lecturer in, in Edith Cowan University School of Business and Law, is an Ascolite member, and recently, and I think this is worthy of congratulations, became a senior fellow of Advance HE, um, the UK-based higher education organisation. Um, she has also been a recipient of the ECU Vice Chancellor's Citation in 2020 and an Australian Award for University Teaching in 2021 for our outstanding contributions to student learning, um, which is pretty impressive. Welcome, Joe. Um, Joe is going to be talking to us about how data provides us with insights into the effectiveness of learning and teaching practices and enables us to monitor trends, make comparisons, and plan intentional evidence-informed improvements to learning. Um, but what happens when changes don't produce the desired results, uh, which I think is a really provocative and, and a common question. Um, and with that, I'm going to say, you're very welcome, Joe. We are looking forward to hearing what you've got to say very much and perhaps finding out the answer to that question. Over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Appreciate it. Um, good morning from me and good afternoon to you. Um, obviously, thank you for that um, amazing intro, Keith. That was really great. I'm um, presenting to you today from Wajak Noongar Budja, which is the uh, Noongar people in Western Australia. Um, and I'd like to also um, pay my respects to the elders past and present. And thank you all for joining me here today. Um, it's, it's an interesting space using data for... Um, uh, for learning design, but also thinking about using data for other reasons, not just for analysing our work. So I'm hoping to cover a little bit of that today. I'll start with a quick background on ECU. So um, Edith Cowan University is a West Australian university um, that's committed to widening participation in, in education. So we have a student cohort of about 30,000. Um, I've been with ECU since 2007 in a range of different roles, right down to student service areas, um, formerly teaching in business and law. Um, and I'm currently uh, on a project team um, as a curriculum consultant around careers and will, which is a really interesting and progressive space. Um, so I don't want to talk about myself so much today as um, share with you some practice examples, some failures, and I really am hoping to um, hear from you about what you're doing in your practice. So I definitely won't be sharing anything new, um, nor am I pretending to be an expert in this field. I really just want to, I really love learning design, and I just want to get us um, having these more courageous conversations. So the three objectives today, showcase some examples, hopefully get some collaboration and sharing, and maybe stimulate some fresh ideas for you. So um, there'll be a few points where I'll encourage you to throw a few prompts into the discussion forum, um, and then I'll pause um, in a while and we can actually open up the conversation and, and you guys can um, share your own thoughts and ideas. So to get you started, as learning designers, it's common for us to be analysing information um, to inform our decisions. So let's just start by thinking, what, what's your go-to data? What, what do you generally do um, if you are thinking about evaluation in, in your everyday work? So we might ask questions, you know, how many students are enrolled, um, which gives us a gauge on the size of the unit or the size of the cohort. Um, we might explore, you know, access, assessment pass-fail rates to get sort of that level of learning success. Or we might inquire as to um, what students are actually saying about the data, you know, to get insights. So we're getting a, a breadth there. And we use this information to inform our design decisions, but mostly to help us formulate um, some appropriate solutions to challenges. Using oh, the evidence, oh, yeah. Um, are you sharing your screen? Yeah, is it not we, working? We can't see anything. <laughs> oh, that's no good. <laughs> that might have been my fault because I, I shared my screen. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to quit, quit that for a second. And I've lost the controls. That's a problem, Keith. I'm sorry to interrupt your flow. No, that's, that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> Press escape to escape. So I have now lost the 
sharing controls um, completely. You are, you are still co-host, so you should have that. Yeah, okay, I'll just... Right. So you don't have that green share screen thing? No, you know the little window that you, the banner that you get on the top? I haven't got that. Uh, what about at the bottom? There's a green sign that says share screen. No. Um, if you can e email me your uh, presentation, I can share. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's a bit clumsy though, isn't it? I should be able to work it out. Welcome to my lack of tech challenge. <laughs> All right, so if I end my slideshow. Um, Do that, yeah, end the slideshow. All right, so all I'm getting now is is your face, Keith. <laughs> yep. Oh. <laughs> All right. Best laid plans and all that kind of stuff, hey? Um, Going to pause the recording. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. All right, so we had a slight glitch, but we're back. So getting back to evaluation, um, when, you, when you're thinking about it in terms of your practice, I was finding that a lot of what I was doing was happening on the fly. And um, I started to feel as though my contrib contributions were quite invisible and not really recognised. Um, so I paused and, and thought, you know, what's the value of what I'm doing? And I, I thought, no, I've got to really be able to clarify this to levels higher above if we're ever going to get any recognition for the work of learning design and how it really enables our students and their learning. So I began doing things like uh, counting the volume of the support I was providing. And it was worthwhile. The ADTL was very impressed, you know, that's great. But it really didn't mean anything. It wasn't sort of recognising the, the value or the impact of what I'm doing. So it sort of led me to start um, thinking about evaluation in a more purposeful way. And I was looking at how can I demonstrate the volume of work I'm doing, but the impact it's having. And so one way was to um, step back and look at the strategic goals. So I try and purposefully at the start of the year, look, what are the strategic goals of the university? What are the, you know, this year's 2013, 2023 objectives? Um, and it helped me to understand the context of my work and how it aligns um, to, you know, a more meaningful purpose for students. So as an example on the screen today, ECU has a strategic goal around enhancing student success. And so my take on that is that um, last year I worked with more than 150 individual units um, and more than 20 course teams to enhance activities that relate to student success. So this encompasses all the granular little things that we're doing, you know, designing quality assessments, um, supporting the structure of new courses um, and the curriculum alignment. It could be the advice we're providing on tech. All those things I sort of dumped into great big categories, but I'm finding it's really helping me to elevate the value of learning design um, to the audiences that need to hear it, which are the higher levels. So um, just prompting again, how do you use data and, and do you look at it from a range of um, different domains? So that's something I'd like to just quickly mention. Evidence-informed decisions require some analysis of data across a range of variables. And at ECU, we look at these four variables. So student learning covers your assessment pass-fail rates, their progression. Uh, it might include you know, the quilt data on graduate outcome and employability, employment rates, sorry, not employability. And, you know, the perceived value of our students to industry, which is separate from what's the student experience and, and what's the evidence around that. So it could be the uh, mid semester or end of semester surveys, focus groups, could be the ad hoc emails, or it could be the, you know, graduate, um, student experience survey information that we get through Quilt. You know, what are our graduating students saying about their experience with the course and how well it readies them for industry? 
Um, and then the other two areas that we really strongly promote at ECU are peer reflection, where we're encouraging our academics to consider their teaching and learning practices and to seek input and advice on, you know, the alignment, the value of the assessment, those kinds of things, and to also engage in some self-reflection, which is often the element we overlook. And I know that's where I came up with this idea of, all right, I can quantify what I do, but it was only when I really reflected that I realised it wasn't demonstrating the, um, the impact or the overall worth of what I was doing. So just take a moment as you're thinking about the initial prompt I gave you was, what kinds of evidence do you go to? Now consider what's the breadth of that evidence? How well do you feel you're doing across the different domains? Um, it often helps you to sort of just explore new things, or I could be telling you stuff you're already doing. Um, and if it's the latter, I, I really want to hear from you uh, when we take a break. So for me personally, a lot of my analysis has been undertaken on the fly. Um, so I really recognise that it's through our conversations with academics, we write a few scribbled notes on a page and we don't really get the time to formally evaluate every aspect of our, of our work. And um, I'm finding that I'm having to still maintain that, but every now and then just hit the pause button and really take a deep dive into something to, to elevate the practice. So I thought I'd talk to you about a unit that came to my attention um, some time ago. The academic was a, um, he was a professor. He was a very well recognized, a great respect for him even now in his work. But the unit itself was referred to work with, with me as the learning design support person because the student retention in the unit was becoming a problem. So one third to almost a quarter over several semesters of students were withdrawing from the unit. It's a first year, first semester undergrad unit. It's got a medium sized cohort. It introduces students to a range of um, you know, fundamental skills, academic skills, discipline skills, and numeracy. And I worked with the uh, unit coordinator to look at, at the data quite closely and really review what was going on in the unit and give ourselves a clear snapshot. And through this anal analysis, we worked out that enrolments were stable but and growing, but obviously there was this um, issue with withdrawal rates. And But of the students that finished, um, there was really strong positive satisfaction with their overall learning. So we started to think, well, all right, they're coming into the unit and they're liking what they're getting if they stay. But there was a problem because there was only a 60% pass rate, which is nowhere near good enough. So, um, you know, I went back and looked and could see that the 60% pass rate that occurred when I joined the unit it's been part of a declining trend. And you can see how I'm using the data to formulate this story and, and sort of capture the evidence of our thinking as we went along. So I commenced a bit of a review. And at this point, I looked at the, the metrics we had. We had pass fail rates as an indicator of success, and that's not going so well. Withdrawal rates, indicator of progression, again, not going so well, but really good satisfaction. Okay, what are we gonna work with? Um, we looked at um, the declining factors. So what was causing the withdrawal and um, what was the propensity for them to fail? And we found a breadth of evidence um, by looking through benchmarking. We were able to enable um, what kind of assessment regime is happening um, in other universities where this kind of unit is occurring. And we also sought some feedback from industry. What what are you looking for from these graduates in this particular course? And how do you feel about the kinds of learning and assessment that's going on? And it allowed us to put together a really broad unit reform activity. Um, you can see um, it was a, a range of different factors or different pieces of information. So we looked at success, retention, but we also started to look into the, you know, the level of support, the type of support, and also, um, the authenticity of the learning ex, um, activities as a result of industry, you know, feedback. They're going, well, there's a lot of tests. We'd like to assume there's a little bit more being brought in from, from the authentic um, view. And, 
as learning designers, we often know these things, but for the academic to hear it from their respected peers in industry, it, it held a lot more value and really enhanced my ability to sort of make improvements. Um, so we, we put together a really solid range of improvements. We built in some great learning support to help the students with the numeracy components. Um, there was some intentional student to student interaction that we uh, built into the learning activities, a lot clearer alignment between the learning um, outcomes and the assessments to help the students start to understand the relevance of their learning to uh, not just this unit, but you know, their profession and their career aspirations. And we were feeling pretty good. We thought, yeah, we've nailed this. And then we got this. And it was such a shock. It was like, oh, I failed. And it was at about this time I started to lose the enthusiasm of the academic. And I'm absolutely certain that you're all nodding in agreement now. Okay, we've done this thing. You're of no value because you just brought me more decline in the pass rates because you made it more authentic. And I want to go back to what I was doing before. What triggered me to continue was a conversation I had where the academics started to say this, this unit is where the course gets to weed out the students that are not suitable for the profession. You know, higher fail rates and withdrawal rates early, they're necessary, they're a necessary part of natural course attrition. The students really need to learn to do more to help themselves. So a big sigh. Um, at this point, I determined I wasn't settling. This is not going to happen. There is a way we can improve success. And it was then that I looked at the, the initial evaluation and really started to um, bring pieces of information together or, or that, you know, triangulation that if you're not doing, please do. And I'm sure most of you are. What were our students? Who are they? So I looked at characteristics of students first. Um, the cohort had a really high um, level of mature age students. And interestingly, in their program, this first semester, first year unit was not being taken by our first semester, first year cohort. People were putting it off. And, and so a lot of the students were actually in their third year of, of the course, which would explain why they might have been struggling with the consequent, the, the subsequent units from this. Um, Age became an impacting factor on withdrawals. So when I did a deeper dive analysis of the um, early withdrawals, it was a lot to do with students um, who perhaps weren't straight from school. And so that, were, that was interesting data. I then looked a little more closely at um, the support that was going on, because obviously if students like what they're doing, but they're not passing, our support is letting them down. So we previously embedded um, some new learning support features. Uh, we'd looked at the frequency um, of access of support and we found that students were really using the revision materials that we'd embedded as part of the initial restructure, um, but they weren't necessarily using these um, peer engaged out of class learning support activities. Um, the students who did attend the co-curric out of class support every one of them was passing. So that to me was like, yeah, I'm starting to see some solutions. We made some really other uh, new purposeful changes. One was to put the numeracy component of the unit right up front, because clearly students were progressing through the unit, but at a point at which they had that choice to go on or withdraw, they were withdrawing. And it was also at about the time they started the numeracy component of the unit. Um, it was an interesting conversation because the academic said to me, the numeracy is not bad. It's year 10 math. It's bibness. <laughs> and I, um, I did a little sh shrug and sigh and said, um, I don't know if I remember bibness. I could probably sound it out. Brackets. I don't remember what the I was. He's like, brackets, indices, multiply, um, divide. I don't know. I'm still getting it wrong. No one remembers year 10 maths. So he was making a lot of assumptions about his students. So solutions, we put the numeracy up front. The support that was within the unit 
was working. Go and do the revision. You're going to need it. Year 10 maths, bring it on. We then took the support that was happening outside of class that we could pretty much show was working and we embedded it in the class. So we basically triangulated the um, three pictures on the, on the screen, numeracy support, propensity to access support and the timing of it. We brought our learning support peers actually into class and it, it was amazing the results. So they had more in interaction during the numeracy. They had these peers that were other students, but perhaps just a little more confident with, with the data and the analysis that was going on. And we found even the online students were coming to these classes and engaging and building rapport with other students. So it had that, you know, student to student engagement, which was just brilliant. And all the little things we'd tried previously weren't working until we brought these peers into the class. The result was that the attendance at the co-curricular classes doubled. Um, students were, and these were specially scheduled for this particular unit cohort to come along. We found that students were gaining confidence and starting to help one another with their data analysis, um, which was you know, obviously brilliant. And they were forming some um, peer colleagues for themselves to move through their course. By having the numeracy at the start of the semester, we found the propensity to withdraw eased back a great deal because people had already overcome their challenge or their fear before those census and financial penalty withdrawal dates. So there was a lot of turnaround in, in a really positive way. Um, I'd also like to just show you the overall success. So you can see that I came in where there was this declining trend of students passing and we finally, after a couple of semesters, made a really positive impact. I'd also like to pause on the slide. You can see how I've used um, not so great data and actually used tracked the trend over time to really represent the impact of the work. And, you know, I had to be brave and actually call out the, the fact that I put in, all, you know, textbook improvements, but it wasn't enough. And that's where the real impact of what I was doing started to actually gain a bit of momentum. So I'm hoping that perhaps talking through this is helping to inspire your practice a little bit. And I'll take you back to the original question. How are you using data? Do you now have a couple of ideas or, or a brain bubble that has occurred just through this little moment in time and do you feel a little more confident to perhaps share the impact of what you're doing this is a point at which I'll pause Keith and see if we've had any feedback we we have um lots lots of comments in the chat and and I'm just mm. gonna put to you some of the questions that have already arisen um so I'm gonna paraphrase but if you're if you want to talk more about it, and I say this is your question, please, please turn on your mic and tell us. Um, so Penny said, um, this is really interesting, Joe. Uh, I'm wondering about the integration of the subject with the rest of the course. So perhaps getting into that whole of course design and, and where that all fit. Did you want to make any thoughts or comments about that? Yeah, that's a great point. And I'm so pleased that someone raised it because when I was trying to summarise what to show and how, how much to share with you, there were a few elements like that that I sort of just carved off. So, yes, the um, part of the initial design for this was to ask the academic to go out to industry and this is a fundamental unit. Uh, students need to know this data. It, it's critical to their profession, but also where does this fit in the course and how do we, how we conquered the withdrawal rates was actually raising that in the uh, information about the course and the information about the unit that students read prior to enrolling. So yes, definitely took that holistic course view, um, but love to hear more about other things that people might be doing in relation to that. Yeah, uh, Anna, Anna, in relation to the discussion about numeracy development, Anna said, very much for for information literacy development as well you know? <laughs> yeah yeah 
Um, we've and built that, in the library um, as well. We're, we're building the library a lot into classes now for that same reason. You know, it's one thing to say to the students, go here, do a library thing. But by bringing the, the people into the class, the students sort of put a name and a face together. And that's virtual classes as well as on-campus classes. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Sandra had a question about uh, what was the proportion of international students in the unit and did the language background... Uh, was that looked at in the analysis? Yeah, we did. I looked. Uh, we've got some access to some brilliant data at ECU. We had a DVC come in um, around 2016 who recognised what we were calling for. We need to be able to jump into units and courses and really find out who our students are because the academics do, and obviously if you're talking education, they do. They go deep into who are my students? Who are my learners? All that stuff we really love. But I was working in medical and health science. So I'm working with, you know, chemists and biologists and, and they're like, yeah, the students, they're like mature age or they're, you know, different areas. I can now access data on how many international students in this unit, it was about five or 6%. It's, it's now about 10%. So we're actually engaging a a breadth of cohort now that the unit and the course is gaining a little bit of a better reputation. Um, we have the option for students to acknowledge disability so we could look at the data on equity and inclusion and there weren't a lot of students claiming that even though we recognise there probably would be a need for that. Um, I could recognise uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander students um, because this was a health science kind of area um, we really wanted to acknowledge and embrace um, our student cohort from all the diversity. And we found that because we were dealing with numeracy, the content didn't change as much as the way we were supporting them. Hence those, um, those elements of bringing our student peers into class and finding student peers that were their own, not just the professor and you know his wisdom. And he's a very engaging person, but it was bringing right down to that social sense of um, learning. Mm. Sa Sandra, I think this was more of a comment than a question, but I think it's a very good comment. Um, yep. She said, uh, it's about meeting students where they're at, but yes. also about having clear entry criteria. As one example of that, outcomes are affected by factors wider than, than just the design of the course. Um, yeah. you know, and and I, I, we see that in so many courses where, where there's professional accreditation or certification related to the course isn't there you know it's yeah it's not just a learning design issue it's a learning design within a broader context mm -hmm. issue I, I hope I got that right Sandra if that's what you meant yep <laughs> okay yeah yeah and like getting back to one of the reasons I introduced ECU to you at the start is that you know we are actually looking to widen participation and so Part of that is us educating our academics that the students are going to come into your courses with really diverse skills. You've got your ATAR students, the, the high achievers, but you're also going to need to accept that you've got students who, who are first in family and don't have those unique um, people around them to really push them through the tough days. So um, that's why the learning support was actually such a significant feature of the success in this particular case. Mm. I'd like to throw the question back out to the group. We, we've got these beautiful Tableau reports now, unit level, course level, institutional level, where I can now go, okay, I've got this particular unit. I can jump in and say, right, what's the course? What are the course outcomes? How big is the, the student cohort? I can then drill down at a unit level into who are the learners, um, what's their progression like, that kind of thing. Is that unique? Do, do, do you have, does, do people uniquely have that access to that level of data or is that perhaps an inhibitor to practice in learning design? Anyone want to comment? <laughs> um, just from you, Taz, it's really hard, like it's not impossible, but it's hard to get some of that level of data at especially for your average academic we get reports yeah. but it use it's usually a lot of very aggregate data and decisions often get made on rather aggregate data as well um, I hear you. <laughs> and 
uh, it, especially if we're trying to drill down into the actual learning design within the unit. And I know that the context you've been talking about is a bit broader than that. Um, it's very hard for us to get that fine scale data that sort of helps us look at what's distinguishing um, whether, uh, you know, do any sort of like cluster analysis or anything on who are the students who are doing well and who are the students who aren't doing well and why and what what behaviours have they exhibited. It's really hard to track that. And it takes a long time, doesn't it? So it takes, I, I yeah, it takes a long time, but we just can't get the data to do it. Keep keep asking, honestly, don't give up. I, I understand you won't necessarily be able to straight away. Um, I started doing this work with, with the Centre for Learning and Teaching at ECU in about 2011. And in 2016, they started to hear us. So just keep pushing, keep, keep you know, go away. Say, ECU, they've got these reports where they can get just a very slight taste of what their cohort is and, and that kind of lower level data. And it really has enabled their practice. Just see how you go. I really hear you when you say um, uh, the, the broad features, you know, pass fail rates, oh, that they're failing. Just, you know, go and do something about it. It was being able to unpack the data was, was really, um, um, lost the word, the thing that helps you move forward. Yes, well, we had a lot, yeah, we had a huge first year anatomy unit that had enormous, uh, has still has enormous numbers of students, like 700 or something. Um, and a high attrition and failure rate, but there were very, very different cohorts involved in that. So the lecturers yeah. were already doing absolutely beyond best practice stuff around engagement and student support, but it was just having very different impacts for different cohorts. Yeah. And the sort of solution that they were told to do was go away and do all these great things that they were already doing to address the attrition problem. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was interesting in that regard, but we couldn't sort of show that, look, it's the issue is with an unprepared cohort. Yeah. That need more support, yes. Um, do, do you want to do one more kind of comment or do you want to move on? Uh, I can take another one, I'm more than happy. Uh, it's yeah, I, I really want you to do this one. <laughs> I think it's such a great point. Anna, Anna, do you want to do you want to speak to your question? Because uh, I think you'll do it better justice than I would. <laughs> Sorry, hang on. I, I'll need to put my mic on. Just a moment. We can hear you clearly. <laughs> oh no! I hope I haven't scared Anna. Oh, Sorry. No, no, you away. haven't. <laughs> um, Joe, I'm a librarian, and for you know, for many years we've tried the embedded approach. But what happens is. Um, being part of the information literacy development, um, it is seen as a bolt-on. So we are invited in, we are wheeled into the class at, you know, at the point where it's needed. Sometimes no, sometimes yes. It works better at point of need, but sometimes, but the, in, in terms of the whole concept of this being wheeled in and wheeled out, there is no value that the student can see, apart from the fact that you're here in front of them for the moment. Um, they can't actually see the value of what you're doing. So what we do is actually hidden. And trying to identify how we can actually, um, I know how to do it, but I've never actually convinced an academic that constructive alignment and setting a particular learning outcome that works with development of information literacy skills uh, actually is a good way forward because it's not a fix it that uh, yeah. the instant fix it that wheeling a librarian and wheeling them out again actually yeah. does in the moment. So I was wondering how is are any ideas on how we can actually gather data that says this has worked because the students have improved here, here and here. And this is what we struggle in. Yeah, and that's complex. And I don't have I a, 
I don't have a straightforward answer. So what I'll do is I'll tell you the, the bubbles that popped into my head while you were speaking in case one of them prompts you or someone else listening with some ideas. My first thing would be, the first thing I thought of was I recognise what you're saying. I feel the same as a learning designer. Look bigger. So start with um, go to the institution's goals and priorities and find the one that talks about student learning and student success. And then go to your course level. Um, or We use unit and course um, at in WA but sometimes it's program and course for you but the program or course level outcomes because I know that in the courses I work with we have a whole outcome that relates to students having a certain level of digital literacy and it needs to be introduced consolidated and demonstrated like three metrics across the course and that aligns with TEXA a TEXA requirement that we give course outcomes and that students will have three measures throughout their course on how they're going. And then what you're doing is you're going, all right, so the bigger impact, the really bigger impact of the little granular things that you're doing within a unit are that I'm going to help you or enable reaching these course outcomes. And then when you gather, all right, the last unit I went into or course I went into and supported, I, I helped you know, 150 students or 300 students in the semester, you can start to bridge that gap with, I've got a bit of a volume of the work I've done and, an, and a, a link to that higher purpose. Whether it actually enables the students, that's where you've got to get the academic involved. That's the second part of this. I, I at the AAUT award that I, I um, was given was in collaboration with the Associate Dean for Teaching and Learning in the school. And the award was based on the fact that the learning design impact works, but it only works when you've got the same message coming from above and the learning design is pushing, pushing these things into action on the side. So from a library point of view, it's the same. You need to get high level support for the importance of what you're doing and then you can push it in from the side but when I was trying to do it all by myself it wasn't enough it was only when we got higher levels of of recognition that we started to really get some um, momentum I'd be happy to hear from others if you've got better ideas more ideas I'm just keeping an eye on the time as well. Uh, do yep. we do we want to move on? Yep, I can. I've got two more to go. So um, the final thing I've got for you is we've talked about this a little bit. So think about where you look. And the example just then was was one example. So start trying to push yourself to look look high. Start with a moment in time and then tell a story backwards. Here's an example. This unit is. Um, was sent to me, the academic has won an AAUT Teaching Excellence Award. So I was, talk about feeling useless before you step in the door. I thought, how am I going to help this person to improve a unit? But they'd been sent to me because of that high level data that doesn't really understand the complexities of the situation. We had a student um, evaluation data that said students don't like this unit at a negative negative rate we've got to do something about it and it was literally the uh, survey results from this moment in time at that point I didn't know these other results I knocked on this person's door and said hi I'm here to help not sure I can help but let's have a chat anyway and she sat down and explained why that particular data was so poor. The cohort of students were bad, they were very disruptive, blah, 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 all to do with that one cohort, which is true. It probably did have an impact. But I went backwards and had a bit of a look and went, well, actually, it was already declining a little bit before this semester. So had we left things unchanged, it quite possibly could have been a slightly you know more negative maybe not quite as low but it would have still been a negative trajectory 
I, I took the time to look into the unit and there were some actual big changes that were needed. So she was doing a great job with the people, but she was giving them too much information. It was overloaded. And she wasn't necessarily moving her teaching practice with the expectations of the students. So we, we made some changes around her use of tech and getting students looking at the LMS for information and looking for themselves for information instead of her piling them up with thousands and thousands of documents to read. It's like, get them to go and find one all by themselves in the library. And we made a lot of changes and, and had this remarkable positive impact. It sort of started to return the unit to where it was. None of that story matters. The story that matters today is grab your data, put it on a trend line and think about the impact and then go backwards from here and tell your story. People start to listen. I can't explain to you. When I put this story to someone high up in my teaching and learning centre and the school, their eyes opened and suddenly I got some momentum. Another way that I've done that, and I promise this is my last one for the day, this data is based on a uh, retention from day one of semester to the end of the unit, not the, not the withdrawals that happened prior to day one. And when I looked at this data in a table, I kind of went, yeah, it's pretty good. There's not much difference. It was like, you know, one, one and a half percent. Yeah, we're doing okay. It fluctuates a bit. It was only when I threw it into a chart that I went, oh, hang on a minute. We've got a trend line. And then went backwards and told the story and worked out that at this point here, we implemented some very purposeful retention enhancement. I'm going to say strategies. It was more of a practice. The whole school were expected to do these five things every semester. Welcome videos and, you know, student to student engagement, early feedback. There was all these strategies. This was quite a few years ago before that became normal practice. And you can see that it actually did have a very slight positive impact on overall retention. Try it. I, I just challenge you, please go and try that with your practice and see what you can come up with. That's it. I'm done for the day. Thank you so much for coming along and listening. And I hope I've stimulated some fresh ideas. Yeah, thanks, Joe. I, I think uh, um, most of the questions in the chat has already been answered. Um, but uh, I'll just uh, open the floor for any other uh, questions. But before I do that, I just have a question, like it is an inclusivity question that we always ask uh, to our um, speaker most of the time, that when we evaluate courses, how can we kind of capture the, the views of students like, you know, um, so of course students data that, that comes through to, uh, but is, is there any other way like uh, non-formal or any other, you know, uh, formal way apart from that student satisfaction surveys that uh, we can capture their um, you know uh, ideas about what um, what should be done and what engages them or what that and didn't. yeah it's quite a topical um, subject at the moment and something we're working on a lot I don't have a solution to that we are experimenting with um, bringing groups of students together through you know conversations and using those out of class um, communities and looking at their engagement with those extra services um, as an opportunity to talk to them. How's your course going? You know, what all could we do? Um, but we don't have a structured solution. There's not a one size fits all in this space. We're also working with a um, very proactive employer as to how the employer can better set up um, the workplace to in include you know the diversities neurodiverse and physically diverse students and and humans and so it's a it's a big question it's a tough one we're only working through conversations at the moment hmm. yes i mean like uh, keith i i i see uh, your point and and i i never liked it because uh, the student satisfaction is the way like if for a student who is really not doing well and not trying to do well and if you give them like a fail or something or or give them hard feedback uh they will be the one who will be writing all the negative things about you in you know uh so no matter what you do and 
uh, I remember one of the units that I I wrote, I, I mean, like I was so frustrated that I, I literally counted that in one um, semester, I wrote 600 emails. And, you know, so, and and all of those are within 24 hours of asking question. And, and yet you get people who said, hmm, you were well supported, nah. So, I mean, like, I really, I mean, like, uh, I'm not very happy with this student satisfaction because that's uh, that's not real measurement, but, yeah. So any other questions from anyone else for Joe? Yeah. Yes, Jeremy, yeah. <sighs> So if we don't have any questions, um, Keith, you have any questions or anything? Oh, good. So if um, nobody has any questions, then um, I, I really uh, wanted to thank you, Joe, for your time and uh, sharing your practice with us. And it was really enlightening because I think that everybody does uh, what they can. And, and many of the things that you said, people do it as an intervention, intervention strategies and, and different things, but capturing those, putting it into a visual that people can uh, interpret really. And, and people can say, yeah, yeah, I can see why, you know, that, that kind of thing. So it's like, I think visual representation and, and, and uh, developing a story through those visual representation of data is, is amazing. So thank you so much for your time. And, um, yeah, as, uh, on behalf of Learning Design Special Interest Group, all three of us, we are very thankful for you um, spending some time for us. Uh, so thank you and- uh, Thank you for having me. And thanks for coming along, people. It was a really great session. Thank you. <laughs>